Good, more, good afternoon, no, good evening. Um, <laughs> uh, I welcome to our Board of Education uh, meeting tonight. Um, those of you who are Zooming in, uh, welcome. Uh, let's begin tonight by pledging allegiance to the flag. Please stand. I pledge allegiance. I will um, entertain a motion, please, to approve the agenda for tonight's meeting. Uh, Paul and John, uh, discussion? All in favor? Motion is carried with unanimous vote. Tonight, um, we begin with um, reports from the uh, principal of the high school and the assistant principal and other helpers who are here. Uh, so welcome and we're happy to have you. Good evening. Uh, thanks for having us. Uh, we're here tonight to share some of the high school school improvement plan for the year. So I have Jason Shetler here, the assistant principal, uh, helping out, and Amy McTorowitz has kindly um, joined us to share a little bit about how she'll play her role in that throughout the course of the year. So we want to start just by giving a little bit of, a little bit of context to the work that we did in the creation of our school improvement plan and some of the questions that really drove the decisions that we made and where it is that we want to go. So just in thinking, um, what is it that we want students to, to take away from their time in North Oval Kit? Um, how will we know if they've learned those things and they've um, developed those skills? Um, and how do we respond when they do? And how do we respond when they don't? Um, and we also want to make sure that were attentive to all of their needs, not just their academic needs. So um, you'll see things in the plan that focus on their academic needs, but also their social and emotional needs, um, so that we can make sure that we're teaching the whole child, uh, so that when they leave here, they're ready to be uh, contributing members of society. So it's important that we're data informed, and so not necessarily using that to drive our decisions, but we're using it to help shape our decisions because um, there's more to it than just the data. There's the student, the person, we have to take those things into consideration. Uh, but that being said, the data does paint part of the picture. Um, and so we looked at our exam rates, our passing and mastery rates, mastery being 85 or higher uh, and proficiency being 65 or higher for the June 2019 school year. Uh, the June 2020 data is very skewed because of COVID. So looking back um, to June 2019 and seeing what the, the passing rates were, uh, we have room for improvement and we know that. Uh, our goal is that 90% of or better of our students will be passing all of those regions exams within the next three years. So we'll work on that. You'll see that goal in, in our work. Um, but that's going to be a driving factor for us. And we believe that um, 
Uh, our students are definitely capable of doing that. We also looked at some other measures, um, our graduation rates, our students who are leaving here with a Regents Diploma, um, and then different cohort information um, to see how our students are doing. Uh, again, that graduation rate from 2018-19 is what we're really looking at. Uh, last year's, again, was a little bit skewed high um, because so many students received Regents exemptions. So that 83% is a number that we want to see improved uh, and we're going to work hard to make sure that we get there. So these two bullets are directly off our SIP plan. So we want to make sure that the staff are collaborating. Many times um, staff work in isolation. So we want to make sure that they're communicating with each other, having those um, important conversations. And overall, the goal is to promote that student achievement by getting them engaged in the process. And the more that students are engaged, the more that they will achieve. The social emotional needs is something that we're also going to build capacity in our teachers so that we address all of the social and emotional needs of our students. This has been a very trying year. And in particular, we want to start off the year with that sense of making sure that we um, address the whole child. So one of the ways in which we can build that capacity is through instructional coaching. And Amy Latorowitz is going to talk a little bit about our instructional coaching program. Hi, my name is Amy Latorowitz. If I haven't met you, this is my 14th year at NRW. I've had the honor of teaching here Spanish. I have taught all levels of Spanish from Spanish ones through the college level. So I do feel like I have pretty good knowledge of our students. Um, it's been my pleasure to be the first instructional coach at the high school for the last three years. And I think it's, oh, thank you. It's a super, super powerful role that I'm in because it is something that teachers from anywhere from one to 30 plus years can benefit from as long as they are open to learning and have that growth mindset. So with that growth mindset, I'm able to, for example, provide professional development, which oftentimes many teachers would get on a PD day or during a faculty meeting. But what's awesome is that I can do this weekly with teachers and even sometimes daily as different things come up in our teaching. Um, with this PD, obviously their craft, the hope is that their craft can be developed by learning these new skills. And then the overall goal would be that student achievement would increase. Also, which is huge for us, is that school-based culture and conditions would better. And the fact that with every person I coach, I really try to create a great relationship with them to let them know that they're cared about and that I'm here for them at any time with life and or teaching in general. So what's really awesome too is that this year is an extra special year because I really feel that every teacher is almost a first time teacher this year with COVID. I mean last year, but really starting the year as a first time teacher. So what's really neat in my role is that I can sense that maybe the staff is confused on something after speaking with people. And then for example, this past week, I sent out an email about how can I help with attendance and or what your plan will look like for the first week of school. And, and on Thursday alone, I was able to assist 20 teachers like that as they responded to me. I was able to bounce around the school and maybe something that might have caused a lot of stress if they worked in isolation was easily solved and they felt better prepared for the start of this week, which went really awesome. And lastly, Mr. Bradley, with the school that he came from, he has a lot of experience with coaching at his school, so he is able to even bring me additional ideas to make our program even better at NRW. So, thanks. It's great to have a resource like me who's been in the district for quite a number of years and understands the, the culture and where things have come from, and she has relationships established with, with people in the district because in my experience with instructional coaching um, and that grassroots approach, the relationship piece in the culture really plays an important role. So we're looking forward to the work that she can do um, in helping our teachers instructionally. Our next goal focuses on community engagement. And we feel like it's a really important thing for the school to play a central role uh, in the North Road Fulbright community. Um, we want students to want to be a part of this and we want parents to be connected and engaged. Um, so we're really going to work on fostering those relationships, um, making sure that we have positive, frequent communication, um, 
will celebrate staff and student accomplishments uh, throughout the year to try to build that culture in that community. Um, we're also going to, once we're able to, um, look to find ways to invite people into the building so that we can get community members here, uh, we can get parents here, put on events that are relevant for them, that are meaningful for them, um, and are responsive to the questions and needs that they have. So a few of the approaches that we'll be utilizing to do that. Um, creating a mental health support team where we'll be able to reach out to people, offer uh, contacts and resources in the community, uh, directly in the community and also in the Wayne County area uh, for people who need it. Uh, using our extracurricular opportunities uh, through the arts, through athletics, uh, to get people in here to show off here are some of the things that our students are capable of and what they're doing in school and what they're learning, not just what they're doing athletically, but also what they're learning and how they're applying that. And then uh, we're fortunate to have Amanda here, a new PR person, and we're going to really utilize her to showcase and highlight all the great things that are happening uh, in the building to promote that positive culture. So this year and in the next three to five years in particular, we want to really focus on having our students maximize their full potential. So we are committed to 90% of the students scoring at the proficient level on the New York State Regents examinations, which is basically a passing level. Along with that, mastery rates increasing by 15% is something else that we're committed to. So mastery is 85 or higher typically. And we know that we have the staff and we want to make sure that these students believe in themselves, that we engage the families, and by administrative support and everything kind of working together, we feel that both of those things are achievable goals for us. One of the things that we can do to help support those goals is the multi-tiered systems of support, or MTSS teams. So we want to make sure that we're increasing student engagement. So the more that students believe in what they're doing, they find it relevant, they find it uh, that they have some choice, they, they're going to achieve that higher level. Uh, the things that we have in place, bi-weekly grade level meetings. So at those grade level meetings, we have people in the same room that talk about all the students. What's working well, what are the things that students are struggling with, and one of the powerful conversations that often comes from those bi-weekly meetings is if there's a student that's struggling in one particular class, but is doing fine in the other classes, there's really some powerful conversation about what are you doing that's different than what I'm doing. Teachers can learn from each other, which is also very motivating for them. They feel great about the situation and ultimately better as kids. Social emotional learning is a focus definitely at the start of the year and throughout the year. You know, it's been a pretty dramatic six months for many of our families and students. We've had economic and social struggles. Um, some families need some support to kind of get back on track and have a uh, normalcy as they're coming out of this pandemic. So we want to make sure that our students are being supported in terms of their social emotional needs. And when I talked earlier about building the capacity of teachers to meet those needs, to recognize and address. And lastly, um, or I'm talking second to last. Uh, last year, we were playing catch up. When we first went out of pause, we were one step ahead of kids. And we had to regroup, redevelop everything that we did, our approaches. So, learning from that, we wanted to make sure that this year we're stockpiling some digital uh, tools that are going to be engaging and relevant to the students. Um, our teachers have been working really hard over the summer and at the start of the school year, developing really high interest resources for the students. So we don't want to be playing catch up. We're, we're already ahead of the curve. And I hope that we never have to pause again. But in the event that we do, we're going to be prepared for them. And they're not going to lose any time as we kind of remove and, and come up with materials. Lastly, monthly farm meetings. Well, uh, excuse me, curriculum maps and common assessment. Those department meetings give us an opportunity to virtually align the curriculum so that we're using common language K through 12 so that the students are relearning new structures and systems and vocabulary that's consistent all the way through. And we've also worked on developing priority standards. So things that are key importance 
So they're, they're not eliminating other speakers, but they're really kind of highlighting and focusing in on a certain no, uh, number of priority standards that students not, that's, excuse me, definitely need to have in place. And then looking at ways for the grades that come before and after to support those priority standards. Our last goals um, focus directly on finance. Uh, we understand the importance of being fiscally responsible, uh, especially in time being as they are right now. Um, so we'll work with departments to, um, to make sure uh, that all of our resources are allocated appropriately, that as we do spend money, that they're in support of the school the plan, um, and they're working towards the, the mission and vision of the school. Um, and we'll make sure that we have the ability uh, that we're we're purchasing things that are being purposeful in that, intentional, um, and finding the most appropriate ways to integrate technology into the classroom so that the students leave our building are prepared for 21st century uh, relevant skills that they'll be using. So, just to help with supporting in that, providing PD for that so the teachers are understand, understand what the, the process is. Um, sometimes it can be a little bit confusing, so clarifying that with them. Um, working with Bridget, she's great, a great resource, and um, acquiring grant funding and additional money that we can use. So working with her to seek those opportunities, to get those that want to care for us. Um, and then just prioritizing things. So we have a lot of requests uh, for different purchases, but recognizing we have to be purposeful with that, we have to be intentional. Uh, and we have to weigh pros and cons, understanding we can buy everything, um, but buying things that are going to be the most appropriate for our student needs uh, and, and meet to reach the most number of students. Um, we also met with the Boosters Club already. They do a lot of really great things to support the district in various ways, and they can help offset some costs uh, for things around the district. Uh, and we've already started talking to them about a few different ways they can be supportive of that. So uh, we're looking forward to continuing that relationship and including them in ways that we can. So with that, that concludes the overview of our school improvement plan. plan. Uh, we appreciate you asking me to present about it and look forward to uh, part with you here and give you an update on how things are going uh, as we get into the start of school. Take the questions. Very good, thank you. Ward, do you have a member? Do you have some questions or comments you'd like to make? Well, three questions. First one's very good. Is this a new position due to the staff development? It's not. Well, I can tell you're excited, and I'm excited for it. My second uh, question is. Uh, on the community engagement second slide, it's the mental health support team creation. That's easy to do. So, what I see here is everyone in this team currently is in the district where district four is that correct? Currently, okay. Do we have the? Do we, have we considered being able to reach out to someone outside the district? think that's beneficial. So we do work with um, the locker in the Wayne County Mental Health um, and we'll include her in those conversations and she has other resources and people that we can connect with. Um, a big part of what the team will do is connect to those outside agencies uh, as needed cases. Okay, good, thanks. Uh, last nice question for me anyway. And the Jay, you may have already mentioned it. The mastery rates will increase by 15%. That's on the, uh, from the June 2019 meeting. And is that also a three to five year goal, or is that a three year goal? Yeah, in three years, we would like to do that. Okay, great, thanks. Anyone else? John? I think it's great that your plan has the uh, public relations aspect of the community. I think um, we need to be deluging our parents and community with how good we are. Um, secondly, I think the um, 
curriculum maps that were in our packet. Um, I think Megan put them in the mention of them. They're digitized and parents will be able to get a hold of them. I think that's a very powerful, it could be a very powerful uh, thing for parents to know what their kids are going to be doing. Uh, what a, a question for you, uh, students that are at home and need mental assistance, uh, how do they reach out or how do we reach out? So if they're virtual learners right now, so our students who are virtual learners, the daily attendance piece uh, has some SEO questions. So we ask that, do you need anything? Uh, do you need support with this? Can anybody from school reach out to you? So if they're you know, feeling like they're in crisis or they need to talk to somebody, every day is part of their attendance piece. They're submitting that, that's coming in, and we have a person monitoring it. So if a student mentions, right, I'd like to hear from this person, or I can really use some information about this, then that will get routed to the appropriate person, and that person will reach out directly to the student. Okay, okay. Great. Thank you. And we're also doing cross checks too, as staff members, we also are trying to get the along with our groups of eight tier levels. So we're, we're checking them on all tests. So it's not just in person. And by checking, you mean? So, like in conversation. so for example, a lot of us are sitting in every meeting and say, how are you doing? And then if they say horrible, it might lead to another question of, how can I help you? So many teachers in that end up checking the form somewhere in the yeah, I think that's more than important nowadays because they get, in the old days without COVID, it's easier if that could be possible. But COVID adds another layer of stress and anxiety. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. It's very informative and it's good to know how things are progressing in the high school. Thank you. And we applaud you. Have a good year. Thank you. Can we applaud you? Yes, Paul. You may go ahead. While we're still um, we're talking specifically about school, uh, the schools itself, the buildings, um, um, Mr. Pollan is going to give us just a short update on opening up today. First day back for the kids, or, or first day back for some kids online, which is a whole different quality. Yes, so thank you. And thank you to Mr. Bradley, Mr. Shetler, and Mrs. Watorowitz for the great update. Way to start the year off with some positive um, news on our school improvement plan. So today um, went remarkably well. Uh, I would say uh, we were very pleased with the response from our community. We were very pleased with the response of our staff, everyone from uh, custodians, bus drivers, secretaries, administrators, and certainly our teachers did a wonderful job. Um, I know that this morning, the high school, the, the only issue they ran into was a couple of students that were virtual who decided to show up today. Um, so that's just a, a testament to the plan that the high school has in place. I think the middle school received several students who've also inquired about changing over from virtual to being back on campus. And again, I just would like to reiterate, I think that that's a very, um, very positive sign that the community has been so responsive to the plan and that the school's been responsive to the community need. Um, I know Mr. Megan, Ms. Pagliotti, myself were uh, present at the whole facility, the elementary and the middle school, high school campus. And what we saw was a lot of smiling faces a lot of routines and procedures going over and as Ms. Wittorowicz said, a lot of checking in, really breaking the ice with our students and getting to know who they were. Um, the, the process in itself was remarkable and I'm, I'm repeating that word because I think collectively it validates the amount of time and effort that the re-entry committee put into meeting all the mandatory assurances from the state 
um, that the plan was executed and that the team came together and functioned really well. And as I said, for a lot of us, it was our first experience with opening day here at North Rose Wolf yet. Um, but I would tell you that if, if it is any indicator of where we're going, I, I say the sky's the limit. The, the, the feeling that I have, and certainly you can jump in or any of the administrators in the audience can jump in, um, just really nice to see how well that went. Really nice to see that the students were kind of coming back in um, and participating. I know there were some sleepy eyes first thing in the morning. Uh, a couple of commented to me specifically that I interrupted their sleep pattern, but um, they forgave me because tomorrow was going to the virtual world. Um, so I just think that between the, the school's opening and what we're anticipating and, and continuing to get back to the new normal, um, we're, we're in good shape. And I, I would say that's a testament to the plan and the people that work on it. Again, I think that the community uh, overwhelming supported us in our efforts. And that's always nice to know when they give you direct feedback that you can accommodate their needs. And as I said, we already have several families that are looking to transition from virtual into the on campus in person instructional model. So it's very good. I'm curious. I'm curious about the virtual learning. I, I imagine it, it's uh, different uh, for different uh, grade level ages, but generally what what do parents, what do students, uh, what can students expect when they're virtually learning? Do they, um, do they uh, tune in at a certain time and they're there for Number of hours. Um, the, how does that work? Are you asking Megan or? Uh, well, one of somebody. <laughs> I just am curious. That, uh, so, as, as you mentioned, you've got different, different levels and it's a mixture. It kind of depends also on, um, on the teacher and the content area as well. So, it's a mixture of all that you said. There's times where they're tuning in and they're interacting directly with teachers. Um, possibly in a small group. There's times where they have um, selections to go online and um, like a playlist where they can watch videos to learn, um, activities to complete and submit through Google Classrooms. Um, there's times where there are office hours where teachers are just available for students to check in if they need extra help. So it really is a mixture of all different things and they get direction from their teachers as to how that works for them. Just to piggyback on that, one of the things that I think to highlight, you know, Megan brought this up during our opening last week, is the amount of hours of professional development that went into the summer. So the work and really being planful and forward thinking, the digital libraries that people have created to try and keep pace with those priority standards that you heard about today, and the fact that we're fortunate enough have a dedicated group of professionals that are solely responsible for ensuring that their digital content is covered um, and that they're checking in. So it really is something that is, is working um, right along with their peers that are here teaching on campus and the students who are learning on campus. So that, that check-in is, I think, important as we for professional development has gone into the work this summer. So, I mean, as far as measuring how successful it will be, I think, as uh, Mr. Schaffer mentioned, we're pretty confident because of all the work that we put in the front loading that staff development um, that we're going to be able to execute in a much different fashion than we were last spring. So we're optimistic that those students won't see much of a drop off. And certainly the social and emotional piece, in particular the social aspect, that's where most of the challenge comes because if the students connecting online, you know, you always want to account for that socialization that happens in the maturation process. Um, that would be a little bit different for those students, but um, as far as the academics, like I said, we're pretty pleased with the staff that we have dedicated to the virtual world and the amount of curriculum that they were able to, you know, work on and implement this summer. It should be good. Any questions, board members? Bob? 
just one question. Are teachers, are any of our teachers reporting their presentations in class? I, I think that there's a combination of models that are going on. Some people are, you know, pre-recording it for the flipped classroom approach. Some people are just doing it live. And in terms of the actual libraries, as far as what they recorded, I think that's a mixed result right now, whether some people are or not. And it's just purely comfort level. I know that some of the teachers we had talked to about when they were creating playlists saying, we don't need to physically see you, but if the teachers are recording the voices and walking the students through the lessons as the PowerPoint plays, and a parent can go back and play that at any time, that would be extremely helpful. And then they did go in with that flexibility uh, uh, in mind so that they were able to offer up lessons. So if a parent gets home at four o'clock, and they want to sit with their child, they can go back at the dinner table, sit down and play through the lesson together. That, that was one of the things I know that Megan asked for specifically was that ability to create flexibility within that flexible environment. Sean, good, thank you. Jason? One of the things I was thinking about this weekend was uh, technical difficulties. Do we have a game plan for uh, unforeseen uh, time when the power goes out and um, a, a, a lesson is unable to be recorded and how they're going to fit that back into their schedule because we know that the time is, a, is quite valuable for teachers. Um, just curious what we thought about that. Well, as far as power being out here or power being out for the students, I mean, they're two different things. Power being out here so that the, the teacher would be unable to uh, um, record their lesson or present their lesson to the students on a Monday. So Tuesday they're doing Monday's lesson, they're day behind. You know, I don't know that we have a specific plan for that yet. However, I know we ran into a technical difficulty last week. Um, and it's something that, you know, as administrators, when we got together Thursday afternoon and briefed on how Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday went, that was a factor that we discussed because there was a a network issue that was not internal and it was not through uh, our, our OCs provider or late net. It was uh, an external provider issue. So the internet went down and that caused quite a ripple effect for the region. Um, but that was one of the things that we talked about saying while we have staff in person, we can make an adjustment. However, we don't have a game plan on if power goes out or internet goes down what to do for those virtual students per se. But I think that, you know, part of teaching is uh, the ability to create on the fly. And that that's one of the things that our staff is going to grow accustomed to this year. It's because as they said, we're, we're in the period right now where we're on campus and we're being very mindful of the fact that this could be, you know, the model that we're in for, you know, the near future and conceivably for the intermediate time um, so we're going to look at that, but as those situations come up, we're going to have to tackle it and game plan the best way to serve our students. Thank you. Neil Miller, has there been a definitive uh, uh, decision on fall sports yet? Well, it's funny, Mr. Tech, you just asked me that. So Friday night, about 9 o'clock, we received a 45-page guidance document from the state. And prior to coming here, I was in on a Zoom call for Robert Bay is the director of NISVA and several of the athletic directors and administrators from around Section 5. So currently the plan is still that fall sports will begin on September 21st. That's our intention here at North Coast Wolka. Um, you know, they're talking about the, the low to moderate risk of sports. And, you know, they will start with practice and, and get everybody set up. Set up. So we anticipate that as early as tomorrow, some information will go out to the school community and families to make sure that they get signed up for the respective sports, get signed up for um, making sure their physical things are taken care of, and then are able to account for those first few days of practice. Some of the gray areas that we have to account for, because volleyball is considered a high risk sport, um, they won't be able to participate in any competition um, until October at the earliest, but they will be allowed to 
practice to some extent. Um, so we have to get our student athletes accustomed to wearing masks on the field of play or on the court. We have to get our spectators ready for a limited crowd capacity, which is about two spectators per student athlete. Um, there's a lot of things that are being put out there right now that we just have to teach through in every sport, similar to what we said about virtual instruction. There's going to be a level of differentiation that's going to have to occur based on sport and based on the potential risk. So, but obviously between Friday night and today, um, the fact that the state was so responsive and called together for a, a, a section five area wide meeting, that's good. There were a lot of questions that were asked and that, that meeting was videotaped and broadcast. So it's something that, you know, we'll, we'll probably have a link on our website at some point just to kind of go over some of those questions because they think they're repetitive in nature and everybody wants to know, you know, if I'm on the tennis court and I'm six feet away, do I need to wear a mask? And we heard today the answer is yes. Because even though you're on the court, it doesn't mean that you won't chase a ball or the net. It doesn't mean that you won't come into close contact with your competitor. Um, same thing um, with teammates, you know, social distancing on a bus. We have to answer that question. And are we sending JV and varsity athletes to the same facility at the same time on the same bus? So for as many answers as we got from Friday night, have any more questions as well? Well, I'll add one more just quick. With that two per teammate, um, two, uh, two spectators. Spectators, spectators, there we go. Is that per team or is that just for the home team? I think that's for everybody. Okay, so for both teams. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Anyone else? Okay, thank you very much. Glad today went fairly well. Um, the agenda has Board of Education reports. Um, we have established, you know, the liaisons to buildings. Um, and um, some of you are on other committees are having them. The, I would ask in the future that um, you let me know if you have something to report um, from your building or from whatever you're representing uh, so that we can get your name on the agenda. Um, so you need to get that to me the week before if you have something you want to report. Um, but for tonight, uh, do, is there anything any of you want to share with us? Now, this isn't good news. This is just a report of what you represent. Linda? Saturday, the um, legislative committee for four county Zoom meeting, so I kind of speaking at the I'm giving you real early in the morning. Okay. All right, good. Anyone else? All right. Should we do policy? Pardon? Should we do policy? Um, no, let's wait in, until we get to that. Okay. I mean, Yes, the policy committee did meet, but seeing there's policy on the agenda for a first read, we'll wait till we get there. Um, is, either, is there anyone else? Okay. Um, well, then I guess we are ready for policy now, then, John. <laughs> the policy committee did meet, and uh, we have the uh, Two for first read. Uh, 7321 is probably the easiest and most clear cut. Um, it has to do with uh, uh, sensing alcohol, and uh, it's an accurate way of uh, sensing uh, overuse, shall we say, of abuse of, at school property, at school events. The other uh, 1211 uh, has to do with students serving. As ex officio members of the school board, uh, 
uh, we had a discussion about that one, and this is the first read, so I'd like to leave it as it is. Uh, but I think we, I'd like to see a discussion next time uh, because there was a comments made about maybe we should radically change that policy and have not just one student sit on the on the table here, extended as it is, uh, but we might have uh, students come in uh, invited by the, the school administration or teachers having to do with uh, their grade level or having to do with I mean, let's hope there'll be a musical at some point, clubs and sports and the kinds of things that students get into uh, here at the school. And that would be in place of the ex officio member. So I think uh, I'd like you all to consider the two of them, read this as it is, and this is what we did in the past. Uh, and then philosophically come to an uh, idea of a discussion next time about should we stick with this standing policy or should we uh, have a policy that's probably a little bit more flexible and that more students can be heard and we can hear more about what students do. Thank you. Questions, Paul? On that policy that we just discussed, now, is there a way that we could get a student input So, can you expand on that as far as yes, sir. Sure. Yes, sir. In other words, I would like to to know what the students would think would be best. Now, we can certainly do that. I mean, that's something I've talked to the high school administration about already. Uh, I think, as Ms. Bogart explained, you know, there's a few trains of thought as to how to look at that. One, which would be a standing member. And then one which would be by invitation on a regular rotating basis. Um, we certainly can do that and ask them to work with the government teachers and ask the school body members that are, you know, seniors that have been here for four years to certainly weigh in and then probably take that to the underclassmen. Um, given the time frame, we don't have our officers established for all four grade levels yet. However, I do feel like that that's something that they can kind of reach out, come up with a quick survey, and, and find out how students see their voices being represented and what would be the best and most effective model for them to represent our school community and communicate out to the board. Because um, similar to the goals that you saw tonight, one that you're going to see probably is that community engagement piece. So I think tapping into the seniors and some of the under five and certainly something to do. But thank you. I, I know at one time there had been some discussion because quite typically uh, the student rep for the board is very active in a lot of different things. Sometimes cannot attend the meeting because of conflict. And I, I think at one point uh, the thought was put out that there could be a substitute or someone else that could step in and, and provide the same information. I mean, that's something we have for sure. Our students are active. That, that's exactly the mindset that we took into consideration. Um, was that we want our students to be out, we want them to be active, we want them to represent us in so many different areas, whether it's the performing arts, uh, visual arts, interscholastic athletics, or just government. And many of our students are working. Um, and at this point in time, while they don't have to make a choice, we'd rather they not be forced to make a choice. Do I attend a school board meeting or do I attend these other things? Um, and we would work and come up with a schedule that would accommodate everybody's needs and be, be very thoughtful and planned. So I think that's what Mr. Bogart is alluding to, is just to put some time and energy as a board into that thought and whether or not we, we feel like we keep the policy as it is keep the practice as is, or if we will offer it up and engage with more students. Um, because I think by invitation of the Board of Education, there's also a, a nice and healthy way for you all as board members to interact in a positive manner with our students. Because they do agree, it's their voice that we want to kind of use to kind of steer the ship. I said that. Uh, Looking at that, 
Can you turn your volume up, I said? Thank you. Looking at that, um, the students who are on the on grounds would have an opportunity to participate in this type of thing. What does that do with our virtual students? Are they still um, would they still be able to come in and report? Maybe not necessarily like what's going on at grounds, but how it's affecting them and what is happening in their world. I, I think that the way we're utilizing technology right now, um, this this opportunity wouldn't prohibit anyone from participating. I mean, we have our laptops in front of us tonight. It's a choice as to whether you want them to zoom in or not, or whether our public is watching this, participating um, from the comfort of their home or from wherever. And I wouldn't see the students in their learning in a virtual setting would be prohibited from doing that. In fact, I think that it might be nice for all of you to hear the update and how certain students are actually benefiting and have their academic, social, emotional needs met in this fashion because we've reduced some, some stimuli from the equation and are able to focus on perfecting their performance in the classroom and continuing to build themselves up. So I, I wouldn't see remote learning as an obstacle. I see it as a different way to do business. Okay, thank you. Yeah. I would ask that um, as you read this policy, uh, read it very carefully, particularly the first uh, two paragraphs. Um, uh, up to this point, it would appear that we haven't really been following our policy as it's written or as the law expects it to be followed. So um, for our discussion next time, um, read that carefully. Thank you. We come now to the consent agenda. Uh, can I have a motion, please, to put the consent agenda on? Uh, that's items 3A through 3E11, which takes you all the way through page 4. Uh, Linda moves, uh, Jason seconds. Discussion, questions, comments. Hearing none, all in favor of approving the consent agenda? A motion is carried with unanimous vote. Now um, we're on page five. Uh, normally, this would have been um, included in the consent agenda, however, because Linda Egner's name is here for volunteer, she must abstain. Um, and therefore, we, it, it was pulled out to be voted on separately. So, a motion, please, to appoint the volunteer. Don and um, uh, Tina. Discussion? All in favor? And Linda will be absentee, right? Okay. All in favor? Uh, motion is carried. Uh, does anyone have good news tonight to share? Oh? Yes, I've got some good news. And if, uh, perhaps you can roll in on the back of my comment here. But once again, we have our advertisement for bus drivers, and we've hired how many now? Uh, two or three? Two. Two and one to go. That's what we're able to get more than we really need. So, you know, I think that's good news. We're making progress on that. Really nice article in the Lake Shore News about the Rotary Club meeting that we had, that was recently held, and uh, with our staff, someone just sitting here, and uh, nice comments by Megan. And then there was a big article on the Lake Shore News about all the schools reopening. And our school, of course, was included. Very nice comments again from Megan and from look who got his, look who got his uh, face in the newspaper, our superintendent. Well done. And again, a nice, a nice article. Jason already asked about sports. And uh, 
So again, in the Lake Shore News, it was a really nice article right in about the fact that some of these sports will open on the 21st, some won't, as we already discussed earlier. But I just wanted to mention that uh, Coach Burtz was contacted, our soccer coach, and he had a really couple of really nice comments. It was uh, well presented, well done. On. So I'd like to give an ad boy to Mike. Thank you, Paul. Anyone else? I just like to say it was great news. Uh, welcoming back all of the staff for a new school year. Uh, it was um, especially exciting to see all the happy faces who were glad to be back, glad to see each other, glad to get back into the uh, experience of you know, working with the kids um face to face hopefully and um and that goes from the bus drivers to the grounds people to secretaries to the aides and the, the um, teaching staff and the administrators it was just it was a great opening this year and um thank you michael for all you did in promoting that that welcome back and all of you administrators thank you Cindy, can I just mention? Yes. In, uh, I think it was Mr. Megan's report about how many lunches were served. Uh, that was a staggering since last March or something. It was, I, I, I wish I would written it down, but it was well over 100,000. It was amazing. And it was for our community, for our kids. It's a great thing. Yes, people would be amazed uh, to to know uh, how we are uh, taking care of our families nutritionally and, uh, and what the school goes through to accommodate that. A lot of people, a lot of work. Thank you to them. Thank you, Jen. Um, at this time, um, I need a motion to go into executive session uh, for the purpose of uh, the board to discuss the employment history of specific employees. Motion, please. Jason, second. Tina, uh, discussion. All in favor? Motion is carried with unanimous vote. Thank you. Uh, you Zooming people, we will say goodbye to you, but we will be coming back in to probably do some. Carrie, I'm going to turn my video off for now until they come back.
board. Shall we get going here? All right. Uh, we are back in session. Uh, to any of you who are zooming in, uh, thank you for waiting for us, and uh, we will proceed here with business. At this time, I would like a resolution, I mean, a motion, please, to amend our agenda um, to add to res to add resolutions to it. Uh, Paul and um, John, all right. Uh, any discussion? All in favor? Uh, motion is carried by unanimous vote. Um, the first resolution, um, I would like a motion, please, to put the first resolution on, um, which will be the uh, to approve a written agreement. Motion, please. Linda, Tina, discussion. I will read this resolution. Approve written agreement. Be it resolved that the Board of Education, upon recommendation of the Superintendent of Schools and pursuant to education laws, approves the written agreement between the Superintendent of Schools and an employee of the district executed on September 1, 2020. Any other discussion? Hearing none, all in favor? Motion is carried by unanimous vote. Now I'd like a motion to put uh, the resolution um, to uh, approve um, the letter, letter of resignation of Robin Roberts Grant. Motion please, Linda and Tina. I will read this um, resolution. Be it resolved that the Board of Education, upon recommendation of the Superintendent of Schools and pursuant to education law, accepts the resignation from Robert, Robin Roberts Grant as Assistant Principal, the Director of Health, Physical Education, and Athletics, and all of the positions held within the district, effective August 31, 2020. Any discussion? All in favor? Motion is carried by unanimous vote. That completes the um, additional business. Um, a motion please to adjourn. Linda and Isetta, uh, discussion? All in favor? motion is carried by unanimous vote. Thank you and good night.